Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to this webinar. And during today's session, I'll be sharing the webinar with a colleague from the Arno Laboreto. And my name is Olga Mayoral, and I'm a researcher from the Department of Didactics of Science of the University of Valencia. And I'm a visiting fellow at the Arno Laboretum, thanks to the Real Colegio Complutense. And uh, I'd like to introduce Ana Maria Caballero. My pleasure. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today to share some of my experiences in teacher training and outdoor education. Um, I am the Children's Education Fellow at Harvard University. Um, I also work with pre-service teachers at Boston University, so it's a pleasure to be here. So, um, today's session will be carried out, uh, sorry for the, for the noises, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, changing from one to the other. We'll be changing the microphone. I, I hope you can hear it properly. And we'll be talking about science and, and in particular about botany, as I'm a researcher from the Botanic Garden of the University of Valencia and Ana Maria is working at the Arno Laboretum, so we'll focus quite a lot on botany. And then we'll, we'll switch to the importance of outdoor education that we are carrying out in, in both botanical, botanic gardens and arboretum. And uh, we'll focus a little bit on, on what uh, future teachers think on outdoor education. We're working, both of us, with future science teachers. And then we'll finally uh, really deep in, in the real barriers that these science teachers can find in order to really take their, their students to, to the outdoor, to, uh, out to the wild. Uh, we'll focus a little bit in, in teacher training. Uh, we'll be switching, uh, talking a little bit about our experiences with, with our students, future teachers, and we'll also be talking about the, uh, the different uh, factors that that keep our teachers from going, but from what literature is saying in relation to that. So focusing on, on science, what is science? We normally, when we think of science and we think of science teaching in schools, we normally think of a book, of a science book, and uh, we think on the knowledge, but we, we would like to, to focus a little bit on the process because science is knowledge but science is a process and when we are teaching science we should focus on both the knowledge and the process so this process can be really exciting it is exciting and uh, science is useful so there are many factors that are really uh, unencouraged for students and science is something that is ongoing and and it's a, a human in the war so uh, children from the beginning are always willing to learn things related to science to the world that surrounds them. Absolutely. When I work with uh, children, when I work with pre-service teachers and established teachers, I stress that science is learning about the world around us. Um, and so what better way to learn about the world around us than to bring children outside where the magic happens. In the clip you're about to watch, I'm introducing um, the Arnold Arboretum to some Boston University students, pre-service students. Um, and we're really talking at the very beginning about how you can use an outdoor space to create authentic teaching opportunities for young children. If we expect children to learn about ecosystems, to learn about plants, to learn about species, evolution, you need to bring them outside where these things actually happen. Um, and so this is the introductory video clip. And it seems really bizarre that we spend so much of our time teaching about nature that we don't bring the children into nature. Think about the placements that you're at, that you're growing seeds in. We 
As an aside, these little children were fascinated by ladybugs that were crawling all over the concrete and the brick. Um, and in fact, I had asked my students, why? Why so many ladybugs in this one area all at once? And that's a very good way to begin, about, begin learning about nature. Okay, so with the video, we could see that uh, since we're ch children, we, we we want to discover a world, and it's something we should encourage in, in our science classes. So it is really easy with children, because they, they're always willing to learn, to discover the world around them. Um, I told you we were going to focus a little bit on botany, as, as we work really uh, near to, to plants. Um, and when we think of, of botany, it's a, a, a branch of science that focuses on, on plants, and we can easily think that part of the work that scientists working with plants do is coming from field work. So um, the beginning of many research studies projects begin in, in the mountains, in the beaches, uh, spending many, many hours there. Of course, uh, it is not the only part. There's a lot to do afterwards. But uh, a good part of the research begins in, in the field, with field work. Here we can see some colleagues from, from my botanic garden, from the botanic garden of the University of Valencia. They are the researchers from the herbarium, and they go to, to the mountains and to the different landscapes of the Valencian community to collect plants and to take them to the herbarium. The same thing, uh, do the people from the seed bank. Uh, they go and collect the seeds from different areas and take them to, to, the, to the research building in order to make different, um, different essays. Now we switch to the Arno Laboratum, where there's a huge herbarium uh, focused on ornamental plants, all those plants were collected from different areas all around the world. It's a reference herbarium. And of course, uh, as I told you, the work begins in the landscape, in the natural areas, or in this case, with ornamental plants, also in parks and in, in, in the cities. But this data then afterwards goes to the GIS, to database. Uh, scientists have to work with them, and in the end, Sometimes we just see these maps of distribution of, of plants, of species, but there's a lot of field work that has been carried before that, that moment. But then, uh, as I told you, I'm a botanist, but now I'm really engaged in teacher training. So when we arrive to, to our classes and we see our students um, and how we have organized our teaching, we find out ourselves teaching botany, teaching things related to, to plants uh, in the classroom. Right? We've got in this image, we can see that the plants are out. We've got many trees outside, but we're planting inside. We're seeing how the seedlings are coming out. We're seeing how the soil reacts uh, to sunlight. So uh, we really think we should try and push ourselves outside. Yeah, this is a very good point. Uh, we need to continually find ways to connect the indoor learning that's happening in the classroom with the real world outside. Um, 
Unfortunately, if children only grow seeds inside the classroom, they could develop the misconceptions about the needs of plants. Uh, but once they're outside and they see how plants actually react to all the different uh, environmental conditions, uh, they begin to broaden their idea and understanding about the needs of plants and biodiversity. So a group of, of biologists from my department, uh, we all come from, from this <coughs> branch of science uh, linked to, to botany and to different areas of biology. We uh, thought it was a, an interesting topic to focus on, on uh, outdoor education for teacher training. Um, we are carrying out, a, we've got a PhD student, the first person signing this paper. And the first thing we did is make a really uh, profound research on all the articles that have been written and, and the conferences for the last 10 years in order to see what literature said in relation to outdoor education in, in science teaching. Uh, what we found out is that there's not much said and there's not much said in relation to the importance of outdoor education during the training sessions. Um, we're going to present this, this information, this paper, in, uh, in a future <coughs> conference that will be carried out this summer in Zaragoza. And one of the first things we, we, we wanted to do after this literature revision is see what uh, future teachers think about the potential of outdoor education and field work. So uh, what we found out is that they really uh, think it's a good idea, but they just think it's, it means going out and it is a nice experience. Uh, we've been working with those students for one semester and we have realized that after training them in how to design field work, they are able to really understand the potential uh, for the professional development. So we think we should really work hard on teacher training. In this image, we can see uh, one of my pre-service uh, teachers, the one with long black hair. Uh, she's, she's now uh, a secondary teacher, but in this photograph, she was making her practicum. And she was with a real secondary teacher, who's on the right, and with all the students of secondary education. Um, this teacher, uh, this pre-service teacher, is a biologist, uh, and now was studying the master's degree to become a, a science teacher for secondary education. So uh, for her, it was really natural to take the students to a natural area, in this case it's La Albufera de Valencia, a natural park, and to carry out some research in order to see the quality of the water. Why is this happening? Well, all our future teachers that will teach secondary students come from a scientific career. They have studied biology, forestry, environmental science. So they have uh, carried out many field work experiences during their uh, career. Uh, when they arrive to the master's degree, they really are able to, to recognize the potential of taking the, the students during science classes to the wild and, and study different parts. But the problem is that this doesn't happen with primary future teachers. These future teachers don't come from a scientific background and they, ha they haven't got the possibility of understanding this potential unless we really focus on their training and make them realize. And I think this is where public gardens, botanic gardens, arboreta, nature preserves, uh, national parks should partner with pre-service teachers and universities to begin promoting field work uh, with teachers of young children. So there's a really b big potential for collaboration between institutions. So now we'll focus a little bit on the, on the big challenge, the barriers that our teachers find. Um, mostly when we ask future teachers 
uh, these primary future teachers, what they think about taking their students uh, to make field work, they always are um, afraid of losing control. They don't think children will stay like in this photograph really involved in what you're telling them. They think they will escape all around and they're really afraid of this risk and of losing control. Uh, so there have been different articles that focus on these. This one is from 2015. And it is important to, to really understand what these future teachers think about the education. The good news is that they're really willing to overcome these, these barriers, but we have to teach them how to. So just imagine you're a science teacher and you bring your children to this landscape. Uh, can you see yourself teaching here? Maybe it seems uh, even a scary place. Uh, this photograph was taken last week. I went with Anna Maria with the, her pre-service teachers. And wh what challenges do you envision here? What do you have to do if you want to, to bring your students here? Those are the, the questions that arise when, when, when a future teacher decides to, to take the, the children to the wild. And I would venture to also ask you to consider what would it take for you to bring your students to a, a landscape such like that? What, what is it that you need so that you can bring them to a, a place such as the one you saw? So from this article, we've got these, these nice, nice table that summarizes the some of the problems that keep the, the, the teachers from going to, to make field work. We can see that they're grouped in school culture. Um, uh, in there, you can see that there's a problem of use of time. They're always afraid of not having enough time to, to teach content. Uh, the staff inertia, the support, peer support or parental support sometimes. Um, we can see there's also related to organization, to the costs. Maybe if I have to hire a bus to take the students, it will be too, too expensive, the risks. But we've underlined training because many of these barriers can be solved through training. The use of time, the timetable, the risks, the behavior, many of the things can be solved by training properly the pre-service teachers. In fact, uh, my experience with working with Boston public school teachers and teachers in the greater Boston metropolitan area is that they have the same concerns that this uh, research has shown. Teachers uh, w don't always have access to appropriate outdoor spaces. Um, and there's also this perception that what they're doing outside is not important. Uh, those two factors I really think are outside factors. Uh, cultural changes need to happen at a greater level. But concerns around time or confidence or worry or teacher comfort can be addressed through good teacher training. Um, there is the pedagogical point of training. How do you manage children in the landscape? How do you utilize your time? How do you integrate curriculum to, to make the most of what you're doing? Those are decisions that teachers are making on a regular basis. Um, and then the content. They need to have solid, in this case, botanical content um, to bring students outside. But they also need to be familiar with that outdoor space, the landscape of the place where they're going to be taking their students. So many of the factors that uh, came up in research come up with teachers um, and to reiterate, we do believe that many of them can be solved with appropriate uh, teacher training. So coming back to what literature says, uh, this article written by Melissa Lakin, who is an expert on outdoor education, it's a recent article. Uh, she, she begins with risky fun or authentic science. That is the, the challenge. Uh, and in the image we can see in this case we're in the same place in Albufera, but these are uh, pre-service teachers for primary education. 
Um, and uh, the, the man that we see on the top is explaining the, the different uh, difficulties they, they have in managing this natural area. He's explaining things related to migratory birds, uh, how fishermen have to keep out from certain areas because they are protected. So it is, some people could think it's a risk taking your students to a lake, going on a boat. Uh, but of course there's an authentic learning here. They're getting the information from an expert from the place. And we should really move to this kind of, of science teaching. Continuing with this article, uh, Melissa Glacking makes this um, chart of like good practices, good examples that can be taken to, to the landscape with, with the students. And I think it's interesting to focus on, on the part of observing the local. It is important to, to make our teachers really uh, make sure that they go for extended period of time outside. Otherwise, we go to this risky fun. Children are really happy to go out. They spread all around. But if they repeat these activities outside and they uh, realize that it is part of science teaching and they go repeatedly to the same places and they, they already know the place, they know how they have to work, uh, so they will get used to understanding that it is part of science working out in, in the field. Um, I would also like to focus on challenging thinking because uh, we have to try and and make our, our students, uh, it's nice to take them to puzzling situations where they have to try and discover what's happening. Uh, we can make questions. It is important to uh, wait. Sometimes we're expecting them to answer immediately, but it is nice to let them the time to think. Uh, it is important to, to make open questions and to uh, let them speak one with each other. It is also important and to make, uh, push them to make arguments and try to convince their peers or not. Uh, so these are all good practices that are really well highlighted here. In the United States, uh, we are guided by national standards uh, written down in the Next Generation Science Standards, NGSS, which in part promote the teaching of practices of science, science practices with children. And these are practices that mirror the process that scientists engage when they are outside doing field work. Um, as you can see, there are eight practices. Um, and in our teacher training, we need to encourage teachers to think of these practices just as, 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 just as important as the content that they're trying to get across to their students. Um, in the next clip, we're going to show you a video um, that illustrates the power of asking questions, defining problems, using wait time, and allowing students to um, engage in conversation and argument with each other so that they can together construct knowledge. Um, and just to give you some context, we had been outside looking in the leaf litter, collecting uh, invertebrates. And now we're back on the tarp, and each student has an invertebrate in that little bug box. And um, Jasmine, who is uh, this young lady, um, has a slug. And there's something very interesting that she's noticing is happening with the slug. And so we're all going to have a conversation trying to figure out what is it that she's noticed. All right, so now Sarah and Jasmine, talk to you, want to talk about the flood? And it's interesting because it comes out from the side, not like from the end. Or, yeah, it's like coming out now. So it's like exuding something. Yeah, like greenish. And is that the second one or the same one that was coming out before? The first one is already on the side. Yeah, this one. And like just now when I was looking at it, it like touched one of the, I guess like pebbles or whatever that got in. And then like you see it like go. All right, so 
If you look at it from the side with the smaller uh, diameter of the magnification, I want to see if anybody has another idea about what it could be. I've never seen this before, but I have an idea of what it might be. And I was prompted by what you said. It's coming out of its side. It's not coming out of its back end. So that made me wonder, well, what could be coming out of the side of a slug? Look, I know in my cartoons, they like excrete that, like, thick mucus. Yeah, they do excrete that mucus throughout their whole body, but this is doesn't doesn't look like mucus because it's not sort of a slimy pasta. No, it's like it has some you think that that greenish thing is segmented or has some? Oh, yeah. It's all yeah, inside. Yeah. yeah. You see it on. So we're trying to make sense of something that we're not sure what it is. And we're just trying to use as much background information as we possibly can have about animals. And when it's it, when, it, yeah. oh, no, when the pogo oh. was in front of it, like it sensed the pogo. It like crawled it. It hit itself. The slug. It, yeah. it contracted yeah. its body? Yeah, whereas when it sensed the earthworm, it like did it. It just went past it. Interesting. Well, I, I'm imagining that it would have sensed the vibrations of the pill bug, you know, those little sort of feet moving, as opposed to the worm sort of sliding. So maybe it reacted to a greater vibration around it somehow. Those of you who have looked at that, what are you thinking it could also be? If it, if it isn't, say, something is excreting for a waste, what could it be? So uh, I think we did get to the knowledge base. In fact, I went back and, and did some more research and we had been looking at uh, the beginnings of some egg laying by the slug. Pretty fascinating what you find when you're out in the field. Um, the next few slides, very briefly, are just examples of some of the other practices of science that uh, we want to make sure that students and teachers are working on. So analyzing and interpreting data. Um, teachers in the top picture, very briefly, are looking at flower parts, uh, dissecting flowers, and then discussing with each other. It's important for teachers to have the opportunity to look at data together and talk to each other about what's going on. Obtaining evaluation and communicating information, we encourage um, all of our teachers and by extension their students to keep a scientific journal and to use a journal every time they are outside in the landscape. Um, and it is a practice that, that people have to learn to do. The first time you journal, you might not capture as much information as you had wanted, but the more you do it, as Olga had said earlier, the more often we take students outside, 
the more opportunities they have to practice these skills, uh, the better they become at it. Uh, constructing explanations or engaging in argument uh, from evidence. Groups of teachers need to spend time together. Science is a social human endeavor. Uh, science information gets passed on by talking to each other. So being able to work on those practices and construct explanations is vital to the work that scientists do. Developing and using models. Uh, children are natural model makers. Uh, using their bodies to mimic processes or using uh, regular materials to create uh, visual representations of what they're learning in the classroom, in this case, the inner workings of a vascular plant, are all important practices. So we could summarize all these things that we are talking about um, by this statement that was included in one of the articles for outdoor science teaching to be understood as an authentic opportunity for science learning rather than a risky but fun treat. It is critical that professional development programs are developed that respond directly to these issues. We really think this, this sentence summarizes part of what we're saying. So in my work at the Arnold Arboretum, I have created some different professional development offerings and opportunities for teachers um, from the Boston Public Schools, but also surrounding communities. One of them is called the Arboretum for Educators. We meet monthly for two and a half hours uh, at the Arboretum, and we explore the landscape, uh, whatever the landscape has to offer. So for example, last year uh, we delved into leaves and fall color, spring phenology, pond ecosystems. Um, we studied trees in winter, uh, conifers, angiosperms. Uh, giving teachers opportunities to explore a landscape, to learn content, and to practice out in the field the kinds of activities that they would be doing with their students once they bring their students to the Arboretum. Another form of professional development has been our summer institute, uh, where now this summer will be our third year, um, putting together a week-long seminar for teachers on the practices and the processes of science. This particular summer I'm very excited about because it is all about teaching teachers how to do and conduct field work in the field so that they can go back to their schools and bring students to also conduct field work. Last year's theme was structure and function of vascular plants. Um, as you've probably noticed, there's a strong collaboration between Boston University and the Arboretum. The pre-service teachers from the early childhood department come to the Arboretum twice a semester to engage in this important work. And coming to, to Spain, we, we're also using the Botanic Garden of the University of Valencia for our teacher training. In this case, they're uh, pro-service teachers for primary education. And you may have noticed in the last video that uh, that's a parallelism between Boston and, and Valencia. Our students are not used to being in, in natural areas in the wild. Uh, and this is happening all around the world. A population, most population of the world is now living in cities. So our students uh, have not been in contact with nature and cannot even, they even don't know how to dress up when they're going out. Uh, they're not able of, of walking and jumping from one stone to the other. So these are skills that we also have to, to reach, uh, to, we have to work hard with that and, and we have to be very patient because our generation still had some contact with nature, but these new generations have, haven't got it. So bringing them to a botanic garden or to an arboretum, it's a, a safe way of bringing them out to, it's not a completely natural area, but it approaches them to, to real nature. It's a, it's a good place uh, to begin with. Afterwards, you can always go to to wilder areas. We also develop in the Botanic Garden courses um, for secondary uh, teachers in active that are working in, in different high schools. And they, they, they come to the Botanic Garden and 
uh, we show them the way to, to use gardens, not only the botanic garden, but sometimes you can just use the, the trees outside, outside from your school or the garden in front of the school to, to use plants as, as teaching resources. Um, another collaboration that we've had successfully has been with the Harvard uh, Museum of Natural History. Uh, they also run summer institutes for their teachers, primarily from the Cambridge area, um, but often they come and spend a day at the Arboretum uh, so that the teachers can, once again, be in the natural environment of the same plants that they're learning inside. Um, another way of doing professional development and teacher training is really through outreach and publications. This coming summer, I'll have the opportunity to attend uh, the National Symposium for Children and Youth in Ithaca. And my topic will be addressing children's alternative facts, science misconceptions. Um, and that is a way of helping teachers gain some content, but some practical experiences in how to counteract misconceptions that children may have by bringing them outside. All these facts that we are talking about, of course, have uh, the representation in the, f in the different conferences. If we go to the last important conference on uh, science education research that uh, was led in Dublin last summer, uh, we can see that one of the special interest groups focused on science education in out-of-school contexts. So it is an important issue for, for science teachers in general and there was even an invited symposium. So it is, uh, it is an important fact that is being highlighted in all the international conferences. And to, to end up this webinar, we would like to, to highlight the possibilities and the opportunities that we've got for the future, because we want to be successful in our teaching outside and we want to value authentic science. So uh, Anna Maria and I were thinking of some three uh, really good possibilities that we've got for the future. Uh, we think it is a, a good uh, experience to bring pair scientists or experts to our classrooms and take our students out to see how they work. In this case, we've got some rangers from the uh, Valencian area coming to our classes and explaining what their job is. In, in nature. They're explaining things related to plants, to animals, to management of natural areas. Another important issue is the use of uh, new technologies and citizen science. We've got many citizens who are willing to learn about nature and to help uh, sometimes the administration giving data and all that can be made through new technologies. In this case, uh, I've included an example of Quig Natura, which is a, a project we are carrying out in order to, to help students, high, high school students, also primary students, but mostly high, high school students, to uh, learn about plants and even uh, create the contents of uh, each species in which they're interested. And finally, uh, we think collaboration between different universities, different teachers, universities with teachers who are with their primary students, public gardens, arboreta, is essential. Um, we are really happy to, to have had the possibility of meeting, thanks to the Real Colegio Complutense. Uh, this fellowship uh, gave me the opportunity of seeing how they work in the Arnold Arboretum, and we've been for six weeks working together. They have uh, encouraged me to, to get involved in all the projects. I must thank you because I really felt like part of, of your group. And, and the collaboration uh, can continue and we are organizing now a study group uh, that I think will be really fruitful. I, I also had a pleasure in the last six weeks of getting to know you and the work that is being done in Spain is mirrors so much the work that we're doing here in, in America and certainly in the New England. So it, it feels um, nice to know that we're not alone in this, this work, that there are people all over the world who are also working on these issues. And so I look forward to future collaborations. Thank you so much.
Okay, so now uh, we end up the, the webinar. We just are willing to receive questions, suggestions. Uh, this this video will be hung in the in, in the internet, so you'll be able to watching it in, in some weeks. And you can post questions there. We'll be glad to to answer them. But if anybody here present wants to make any question, you're invited. But before that, um, I'd like to thank one, once more the Real Colegio Complutense for being able of, of making these meetings possible. And uh, we hope to be hearing many other webinars on different topics. Any question? There is an online question. Okay, it seems there's an online question. We're going to so say it aloud. Okay, the, the important topics. Somebody from Spain is asking, well, Elias Francisco Amortegui is asking uh, which topics should be uh, should be studied, no? So in what are the important topics for professors to know in order to be able to teach biology for secondary students in the field? In the field, okay. Would you like to answer, Ana Maria? So the question was, what are some of the important topics that a professor needs to know in order to teach biology f through the field, through field work? Um, I think that the one that comes to mind is the whole uh, ecosystem, how ecosystems function. The issues of climate change, global warming, the issues of carbon cycling, nutrient cycling, how these processes work together, it's so much more complex than a linear A leads to B leads to C. Um, so I'm not sure that that's a topic, but that's really, I would venture to say that if you can have an organizing umbrella uh, through which you uh, address your topics, uh, a big essential question such as how, how does the world work? How does the environment continue to grow when ecosystems work. Yeah, I think, uh, I really think as you, and these weeks we have had the opportunity of discussing these things, and, and we, I think we were pointing out three factors, like the landscape was really important, then the, the pedagogy uh, is also important, because even if, if it's biology, but it doesn't matter what you're teaching, but you have to know who you're addressing to, you have to know how to teach, the age to which you are teaching, the kind of students you've got, if they're multicultural groups, if they even understand your language. So that pedagogic part is really important and sometimes you cannot arrive to, to the knowledge if you're not able of, of uh, reaching your, your students with, with a little bit of uh, pedagogy. Would you like to add anything else? Thank you, Elias, for the question. So I think, ah, oh, we've got a question in the room. Um, so I'm guessing that when the subjects, uh, so when the students are picking the scientific subjects in an, like an optional way, they're interested in the topics. But how would you motivate maybe like students that have to take that subject in a compulsory way? So how would you motivate them to actually look forward to the outings and enjoy them, because I guess um, when you have a group of maybe secondary or primary students, they're not all interested in nature, so that could be an issue when you go out to the field because it may cause problems, it may, they may just want to consider it as a fun outing and not as a way of learning. So how would you, what would you recommend to do to motivate the students to really consider the outings as a, as a, a good way to learn. And okay, I'm going to repeat the question just in case it wasn't heard, but uh, they're asking about um, how to encourage, how to motivate students when uh, science is a compulsory subject, because when they really can choose the subject, it's because they're interested, but when they have to uh, go to these classes and they don't enjoy science, um, it is a really good question because we've got even their students that are 
uh, now preparing for being primary school teachers. Many of them squipped science um, subjects because they were afraid. So I think, and it's something we've been talking together, uh, one of the most important things I is to encourage them to feel confident with, with the subject. They're, they're afraid of the questions. Future teachers are afraid of the questions of, t of, of children because children are really interested in science and in nature and they will always, if you're in the classroom, the questions are more controlled. They're related to the book and what you're teaching, but when you go outside, there are many questions that arise. So one of the things is to, to make uh, future teachers confident and tell them, okay, it's okay, we don't know. When we went out and we had this slug, uh, we didn't know what was happening, but once more, it's the process we want to encourage in our students. We want them to make questions. If they don't arrive to, to the right answer, it's not a problem. It's the process they really have to work on, and the knowledge can be reached easily. Now we've got many ways of reaching the knowledge. So uh, that in relation to our students that are future teachers. But these teachers, when they go with children who are not motivated, then it's the same. First of all, you have to make them feel confident and in comfort. It is not always easy. I, I agree, and I, I, we're faced with that issue um, many times at the Arboretum. I will get a phone call from a middle school teacher, science teacher, who wants to bring 155 students to the Arboretum, and what can I do? And I don't have an answer for that. Uh, part of the idea of motivating students to be outside and to do field work is having interactions with adults that care about them. So if you want students to want to be outside, if they're in middle school and high school, they need to come in small groups. They need to have adults that will help um, mitigate some of the worries and concerns about the landscape. Um, they have to have people who can engage students in critical thinking outside without judgment, um, focusing on the process. Uh, I think that students, even middle school students, can be fascinated by watching bees pollinate flowers or butterflies pollinate flowers if they're given the opportunity in small groups, maybe eight students to one adult, to have small conversations and really engage deeply in the landscape. The other part to that is that you really can't bring 155 people out into the landscape once a year at the end of the year as a fun activity and, and not expect that they're going to not take it seriously. So repeated exposure to the outdoors has to permeate what you do all year long so it becomes a part of their practice. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Thank you very much. So I think the time is up. Um, thank you for coming and see you in another occasion. Thank <laughs> you.